Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the welcome everyone to the webinar on the SS25 root cause analysis. Um, it is part of a CPUC proceeding uh, I19-06-016. Uh, we will present the RCA results today, and it is expected to take about 45 minutes to an hour. This will be followed by a question and answer session, um, which will, uh, there will be questions uh, that will be submitted by the parties during the presentation, and some have been presented prior. So, I, so at this point, I want to turn it over to Christina Lai to kick off the presentation. Christina, Hello. Can, can everybody hear me? Hi. Yes. Hello. I Good can. morning. Yeah. Good morning. Thank you, everyone, for joining today's webinar. This is for the CPUC investigation 1906-016. The informational webinar will be hosted and managed by Blade today. The webinar will begin with Blade providing a summary of the root cause analysis report. The remainder of the webinar will be an opportunity for parties to ask factual questions about the contents of the Blade report. Um, I will monitor the webinar and parties may contact me at CLY, that's C as in cat, L as in lucky, and Y as in yes, at cpuc.ca.gov. And if you experience any problems during the webinar, you can contact me at that email address. Um, and sorry, I failed to introduce myself. I'm Christina Lee from the CPUC Energy Division. Um, public participants are in listen-only mode. Only parties will be able to ask questions via email, and the email address has been provided to the parties beforehand. Lastly, I just wanted to remind everybody that this webinar is being recorded. So I will turn it back to Ravi now and the Blade team to get started. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Christina. Um, so let me get started. Uh, I, give me a minute here. There's a bit of a technical difficulty with my screen. Yeah, sorry. Yes. So I want to get started. Uh, this work took over three years to complete. It required a lot of assistance and uh, collaboration and support from various folks. Uh, CPUC and Dogger provided the overall support for the Blades investigation. They facilitated the independence of Blades investigation. They provided support during operations, data, witnessing evidence transfer, etc. Secondly, SoCal Gas uh, also extensively supported and uh, allowed us to uh, complete this investigation successfully. They supported us in two aspects. They provided a substantial amount of data over the last three, four years uh, as the project was ongoing. Extensive data requests were made. We got a lot of data from SoCal Gas, which is the basis of some of the conclusions and interpretations we're going to discuss today. Finally, the operational support, the on-site support during phase one, two, and three were essential to collection of the physical evidence and interpretation. All parties, CPUC, Dogger, and SoCal Gas were as critical in ensuring that we were independent on our interpretation and our conclusions were independent uh, and with no input or influence from any of the parties here. We want to thank them all. Finally, over 23 service companies, various service companies on-site, some of them in laboratory work have supported this project, so I want to acknowledge them also. My name is Ravi Krishnamurthy, and uh, I'm part of Blade Energy Partners. We had over 20 Blade engineers and scientists who worked on this project over the last three, three and a half years. A very diverse skill set ranging all the way from reservoir completion, drilling, metallurgy, corrosion, chemistry was essential to uh, in work on this project. Today, I want to acknowledge the Blade team that is here in the webinar includes Randy, Bill, Nigel, Greg, Mary, Fraser, Samantha, and Claire. They'll be supporting us here as, I, as we go through the webinar. So the webinar is currently scheduled 
for from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Pacific time. The presentation itself should last less than an hour, about an hour. If I speak fast, it should be less. So I will attempt to speak slow so it's clearer. <laughs> uh, as uh, Christina described, uh, uh, the parties to the CPUC will email the questions uh, during or after the presentation. Following the webinar presentation here, presentation part, we will take a 15 minute break, collate the questions, and then answer the questions right after that. So I'll, I'll, announce, I'll announce the time we will get started on. Before I get started on this uh, presentation, I want to make sure I, I clarify a couple of items. Uh, we have a main report that is 300 plus pages, and we have substantial supplementary reports, volumes one through four, um, that describe our work and summarize our work in detail. My, my uh, presentation today and later on when we answer the questions are not intended to modify or revise any of the opinions contained in the report. Uh, in the event that any unintended conflict arises, the report will uh, the report will rule, and uh, not what we uh, verbally state here. The intent of the verbal uh, verbal discussion and presentation today is to clarify and ensure that the contents of the report comes through clearly. Thank you very much uh, for your time today. So let me first start. Uh, we have a main report. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming um, most of you have looked at it. We have a main report that was released on May 16, 2019. It has, oops, sorry. It has, uh, I don't know why my mouse is going up. Give me a minute here. Yeah, it has, uh, it has four main sections to it, okay? And I want to kind of articulate those sections. Uh, the first section discusses SS25 well failure causes. Basically, this focuses on timing, cause of failure, uh, what started it, and what was the sequence and timing. This is very important because this is where we define when exactly the failure happened. Did something happen during the kill attempts? Did it happen prior to October 23rd? So all of that is contained in that section, SS25 well failure cause. The next section of the report is SS25 post leak events. This discusses well deliverability, kill attempts, and the pathway of the gas. The focus of this is the moment the leak was discovered, the well was shut in, and then kill attempts were were attempted. Kill attempts were taken on over a period of time. Uh, this is discussing everything that happened after that. The third section, which is also very important, talks on a slightly larger basis on Aliso Canyon casing integrity. So we have looked at casing failure history, shallow corrosion in the field and any gas storage regulations that were applicable and how they were applied to, this, uh, to the field and the well. Finally, those three elements are integrated in the root cause, where we discuss the methodology that we uses, used and uh, finally uh, establish some root causes and, and mitigation or solutions to those causes. So we'll discuss uh, all of these today. So my presentation outline mimics the report uh, in a sense because it flows. Uh, we will first discuss the approach and timeline. So the intent of this portion of the of the presentation is to discuss what was the approach taken by the project team, uh, what was the timeline, what were the main, main steps. Uh, again, this is a subject of a supplementary report, so I will touch on it at a high level. Then we will delve into SS25 failure, post SS25 leak events, Aliso Canyon casing integrity, and finally conclude with the root causes. So that is the agenda for the presentation. Okay. So let's start with SS25 well. The SS25 well was drilled and completed in 1953 to 54. So it was an oil and gas well for a long period of time, as many of you know, uh, from all the way from 54 to 73. And around 1973, it was converted to a gas storage well. Uh, there was a work over, these are, I'm, I'm highlighting some of the key events that happened through the history of the well. So everybody has a feel for what were the big steps, uh, big major events in the well, and there is not that many actually. There was a work over in 76 uh, where uh, an annular uh, flow safety system, this is a downhole annular flow safety system that was run. It had many operational difficulties. Uh, there was a work over in 79 to replace it. 
and then finally in 80 it was not operational it was uh, it was uh, it was not working very very well so it was removed just to give context these annular force systems are not very common in the upstream upstream industry it is rare these are downhole these are like 8000 feet or so the technology even today is not that well developed uh, so it's it's kind of a new item even in the 80s it was quite pioneering in the 1970s and 80s now through the history of this well there were numerous temperature and noise log over 65 of them from 74 to 2015 there were no incidents and uh, we have reviewed all of that data there is really no indication of anything happening anything untoward in this well until october 23rd 2015 when the casing leak was identified and the well was eventually controlled on February of 2016. And then after we extracted the tubulars, it was p and in September 2018. Just a broad overview on the SS25 well history. This is an important slide. I would like to get everybody oriented on the well bore a little bit. So I like to start from the top. Uh, you have a, a surface casing that is 11 and 3 quarter inch. It is set to about 990 feet and it is cemented if you can see the shaded area outside of the 11 and 3 quarters that is indicating cement and then you have a production casing which is the casing of interest today in this discussion is a seven inch that runs all the way to bottom around 8,000 8, feet then there is a packer and then there is a tubing tubing which is a two and seven eighths tubing i think yeah uh, two and seven inch tubing uh, J55. Uh, the seven inch is L80, N80, most some J55 and N80. So when the well was drilled, uh, the, there were some cementing issues in 54 around the 11 and three quarter inch. They had a lot of lost circulation. This comes into play on the OD corrosion of the 11 and three quarter inch, which will be discussed subsequently here. The key item to note is there were no leaks or failures in SS25 until 23rd. The other important item to note is when in uh, 73, when it was converted to a gas storage well, you have gas that is coming in from the reservoir, uh, reservoir that goes through the tubing, but then there are two ports here that are open. Uh, this is the annular safety system valve leftover ports that then allow the gas come through the annulus. So through the history of SS25, gas went through the tubing and through the annulus here. The annulus meaning the space between two and seven eighths inch tubing and the seven inch casing. So through the history of the well as a gas storage, the gas was going through tubing and casing. So hopefully everybody has a pretty good idea on, uh, on the well board itself. Now, whenever anybody, uh, it, anybody who conducts a root cause analysis, it has to be a very systematic process. Uh, we have to identify the root causes of problems and events and uh, defining the methods uh, at the end of the day following assessment of the problems and events we have to define methods for responding to and preventing them that is the intent of a root cause analysis so it has to be an extremely organized process so we broke this process down into five phases phase zero which uh, which was through the uh, through the course of the project is historical data collection collation analysis how did the well operate what did it do from the beginning of, from the time it existed to today, what kind of issues were there? So lots of data was collected. Phase one is site evidence. Phase two is restoring the site. As everybody knows, there was a large crater around SS25. You had to, you had to fill it up and restore the location to ensure that a uh, drilling rig can get on site. Phase three, probably the most critical part of this uh, project, extracting the tubing, casing, and wellhead. Phase four, we took the casing and the tubing and uh, all the other components, evaluated them non-destructively, studied them metallurgically, tested them, evaluated them in a lab. And uh, phase five is integration. So just sticking with the process, uh, this uh, is a busy slide. It's, there are different colors, so I'm gonna walk through this. It's an important slide. Uh, it, it, as you can see on the left-hand side, I have the years. It started in 2016, January 29th, 2016. We were on site, 2017, 2018, 2019. And we have color-coded the phases. That is phase zero in yellow, phase one in red, 
phase two in dark blue or blue, phase three green, phase four is purple, and finally phase five. And what you notice first is phase zero data collection. We collected the data, we analyzed the data, then we realized we would like to have something else, some other data that is missing. We would go back to SoCal Gas and request more data. They would provide us, we would continue our analysis. So as we were waiting for some of the phases to kick off, a lot of the modeling analysis was kicked off right away. So we wanted to get an idea of what was happening. Phase one was uh, started in March, April of 2016. Basically, this was focused on um, extracting location information. As you can see, that was completed in Q2. Phase two was rig readiness that was completed in Q3, part of Q4. And then phase three is what took substantial amount of time. There were extensive discussions between SoCal Gas, Dogger, and us, and CPUC on phase three operations. And then we started collecting some fluid samples from the tubing, logged the tubing, and then we extracted the tubing. In between this, we also did um, SS25A sampling. That's what this is. And then we continued phase three. We started extracting the casing sometime in Q4 of 2017. It got completed in Q3 of 2018. So we also logged 25B at the end. Uh, we wanted to collect some data from SS25B that was logged. And then, uh, so it's an extensive process. There's a lot of data collected over time. And as you will see in between, uh, in uh, Q1, Q2 of 2018, uh, two, bore, uh, two boreholes were drilled in SS9. And this was essential to the, to the project, uh, to the RCA. The need for this was recognized after some of the analysis of the casing that was already extracted. So going on to phase zero, there were a lot of written records, correspondence, internal memos, ex uh, memos external between within SoCal gas, outside of SoCal gas, uh, completion report, daily reports, drilling reports. Uh, over 57,000 files were collected and reviewed. So that's a monumental amount of data there. The intent of it was to, you, one has to remember the well as uh, the casing has ruptured. Uh, everybody recognizes once the failure happened, many kill attempts were done. The well was intersected, was successfully killed. So the, we recognize that some of the initial condition of the casing was compromised, was changed. Uh, so this data is essential to validate and verify any interpretation we get to do in the future. So phase zero was a very critical part of it. Uh, the intent of it to understand the history of the well, model the field processes, injection, withdrawal, everything else. Continuing, let's delve into SS25 failure. What caused this failure? When did this failure happen? And how did it happen? That is the intent of this portion of the, this segment of the presentation and this, the, the segment of the report. So what you can see here uh, is just to get ourselves oriented, this is the SS25, this is a plan view. I'm looking down on this well. This is the SS25 well, and there is a, this is after the well was successfully killed and under control. And what you will see in this white line here is the crater, outline of the crater as it lays uh, around the well bore. Massive crater, the crater at a depth, I believe, of 25 to 30 feet. I don't have that number exact, it's something around that. And then what you can see here on that side is the other two wells, 25A and 25B. Of course, nothing happened to those wells, the crater is around this well. And so the intent of it was at this point, we don't know what happened. We, as people, people speculated, including us, the seven inch failed, but I really didn't have a handle on that. We didn't know what failed, what ha anything happened to the wellhead, anything happened to the tree, we don't know. We could all estimate and guess that, yeah, nothing happened, but we don't know that for a fact. So phase one was to walk this area, broke this into grids, locate any physical evidence. Was there a piece of valve, piece of fitting that may be relevant to us? And also we collected some oil samples and assessed the condition. The second aspect of this phase also was uh, we could run logs. So we, even though we can't get a rig, we can get a, get a spool and run some logs. We ran what we call two tubing logs. So recognize there is a tubing inside two and seven eighths. At the moment, we suspect the casing, the seven inches uh, failed somewhere at some depth. So we didn't know where. 
So this logging was critical because at this point I want to know, I want to have as much data as we can to see what, what may be happening with the casing, recognizing the casing is the string over. Yeah. So there are two tools here we ran which are important. I'm going to focus on those. Uh, one of them is uh, uh, MID, Defectoscope, and also a microvertolog. We also, this value in the temperature and noise log also to see if there were any movement of gas. But for this discussion, I want to focus on, first I'll talk about the temperature and then focus on MID. What you will see is the pressure, you know, it's hydrostatic, it's a straight line. But temperature, there is a massive anomaly shallow. It is warmer on surface and it's substantially cooler at about 80 to 300 feet, around about 40 degrees F. And then it gets back to a geothermal all the way to the bottom. There's a little bit of a change in slope here, but otherwise it's overall together, sorry. Um, this is, uh, this just tells us that there was a cool zone in the top and of course we are curious why, uh, which we continue to investigate as part of this project. Now we ran an MID tool, uh, the magnetic uh, defectoscope. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's not a tool that is going to give you exact size or corrosion or uh, because it is go running through the tubing and telling us how, what the casing is doing. What this casing identified was a deep significant metal loss at 895 feet. Massive. It, the, the, uh, the, the folks who analyzed uh, the tools were confident that there was a deep, uh, their interpretation was metal loss because that's, it does a volumetric calculation. However, our interpretation at that point was this is most probably the location where the seven inch failed at 895 feet. Now we also ran a magnetic, uh, magnetic log, which is a microverter log, which showed some metal growth in the area of 895. They showed some external metal touching, which kind of indicated to us, and we were speculating at this point, that the seven inch had broken and it was potentially touching the tubing. So that was interpretation. So at this point we had, by April of 2016, we think we had a handle on where it failed. So this impacts extraction of casing, extraction of tubing. But before we go to that, we have to go to phase two. Uh, if you remember that big cellar there uh, that is on this picture, it was filled up with cement and concrete. It was an extensive operation. It was not an easy operation, managed and executed by SoCal Gas. And we had input into it, we had insight into it. And um, so the crater was filled up with, uh, with uh, cement and then concrete or poured on the top and allowed us to be rig ready, which was the intent of phase two. And also as part of phase two, if you remember, I talked about the low temperature zone, shallow 80 to 300 feet. Uh, and also we were curious, was there an aquifer here? Was there a shallow aquifer? Was there a water zone? And uh, we wanted to investigate that. So we did some shallow geology work. Uh, we did uh, electrical resistivity work to understand uh, understand what kind of fluids were, were down. We also did a seismic. So this is an ERT, electrical resistivity tomography. It tells you low resistivity versus high resistivity. These are the low resistivity. These are the high resistivity regions. So we could identify uh, where the water was. We also ran an NMR survey. These were not conclusive as to where the water was, um, was it ice, was it hydrate, but it gave us some indication there were regions of uh, water there and some ice and uh, hydrate were potentially formed. We also had four shallow boreholes because we wanted to make sure the location was safe for a drilling rig to come on site. Uh, so there were four shallow boreholes, 100, 120 feet boreholes that were drilled. So it gave us comfort that the location had enough strength uh, for a rig to get on site. So shallow geology was done early on. So I'm jumping to phase three, which is the critical part of this process. It is tubular extraction. Now the tubular extraction is a critical phase because everybody realized that uh, this is where we are going to find the split casing, parted casing, broken casing, corroded casing. We didn't know how it would look at this point. So various documents were generated, work plans were generated, uh, were reviewed by numerous parties. It included CPUC, Dogger, FIMSA, National Labs, and absolutely SoCal Gas. Everybody reviewed it. Every protocol uh, was reviewed. Uh, comments were made by parties. 
and uh, appropriately incorporated and discussed with those parties. We had fluid and solid sampling procedures. We had evidence security protocol. All, many of these, if not all of them, are in the public domain. And uh, we had to file the regulatory permitting and documents necessary uh, for tubular extraction, which was uh, submitted to Dogger for approval. Uh, we also took some casing and fluid samples from uh, various wells uh, because we were looking for analog corrosion or, or other, other wall loss issues in other wells. So it was an extensive uh, phase three operation. So I'm jumping into the details of this. It's a busy slide, but let me point you to the schematic on the left-hand side. So as you can imagine, uh, where my pointer is, is the tubing. So when you, what you're doing is you're pulling the tubing from the well approximately 40 feet at a time. You're breaking out the connection, then putting it on the rack, and then pulling another, another joint of tubing. So as you keep pulling the tubing, now of course, because of our previous logs, we knew the failure was around 895. There were some measurements during the extraction of the tubing further validated us that the failure was at 895 or 892. So what we did was we had the tubing, and what you'll see here in the schematic is the camera. The tubing was placed right around the area that the casing had failed, and then we ran the camera. And then what you would see in this is this yellow, uh, yellow, yellow region is the end of the tubing. And then once I get out of the tubing, I'm into the casing. This is the casing. So I am right above 895 approximately. Then as I get closer and, and I, uh, we have a yellow line, what you will see is you will see the upper parted seven inch casing. And then when you look closely here on this picture, you will see this lower portion of the seven inch that is parted. So the casing was offset. It had definitely parted. That conclusion was made at this point. So, and of course, operations were paused to make sure our protocols and plans were consistent with that. So this was critical step in the entire process. So we know now where the casing was and how the casing would look. So here I'm showing you a schematic for how the casing would look. So if you can imagine the casing, this is the bottom portion of the casing. This is the top, it had split it around 895 feet. And as you can see, it was offset. So in order to end the, the, the parting of the casing was around approximately 895 feet. The shoe was at 990 feet. There were numerous discussions between SoCalGas and Dogger, how, how farther down the shoe can we go, can we not go? So we were discussing this back and forth. So we definitely were gonna extract the casing right below, below the shoe. So we want to extract the top and part of the bottom portion. Extraction of the upper portion is not difficult. You can just pull, it's, it's broken, so you just pull it out very slowly, very systematically, one joint at a time. And then the next portion, which is more critical, is how do I pull this bottom portion? So there are fishing tools that exist today, but those fishing tools, if you run them through this casing, they will destroy everything, all aspects of the bottom failure. So uh, a tool, uh, a pawl tool was customized for this application. What you will see is these are the pawls, we call them. They are small spring-loaded uh, uh, elements that as you, this is an eight and five eighths that you run with the pawls. When it goes around the parted, parted casing, it will be spring-loaded, so it will be against the wall of the eight and five eighths. When it gets below the connection, it will open up. And then once it opens up, I can pull and apply tension with this eight and five eighths. And then we come in with a cutter here below and cut it at some point. So we did a lot of, lot of camera work was used. As you can see in this camera, you can see the pawl itself. Uh, you can see the pawl physically at the casing. Um, so we could, with all of this view, we were, very, we were extremely careful. And you will see when we get to the metallurgical work, why this was essential to the process without being this cautious in extraction, we would not have been able to interpret the timing of the failure, the type of failure, the sequence of failure. None of that would have been possible without um, this step in the process. Now, once we extracted the seven inch from the bottom, 
we ran a lot of logs. I've highlighted in yellow some of the important ones. There were a lot of logs we ran. Uh, of course, we ran the video camera to look at the 11 and 3 quarter inch holes, which I'm going to show in a bit. We ran the magnetic flux leakage tool uh, to to assess. Sorry, but I don't know why my mouse is so sensitive today. Uh, to assess the internal and external metal loss, we ran an isolation scanner or ultrasonic tool to map the annulus fluid. Uh, this was important because we wanted to understand what is behind the 7 inch and behind the 11 and 3 quarter inch. As everybody knows, there was corrosion on the OD of the 7 inch. So understanding the fluid makeup on the OD was important. Rec of course, recognizing that this well had been killed, the fluids had been replaced. And finally, UCI tool, which is high resolution ID, OD, and uh, lithology mapping. So all of that data fed into our interpretation uh, that we did. Now, getting into phase four, this was an extensive process. Uh, sorry about this, I have to be careful. Uh, we examined the casing and tubing joint using automated UT to assess for defects across all of them. We did some laser measurements on the OD of the seven inch, ID of the seven inch, quantified the corrosion. We also did connection testing because we had various theories within Blade about uh, what would have caused this failure. So one of them was dependent on the connection leaking. So we were testing it. The leak was very small. I don't address this here in this presentation. The leak rates are very small. It's addressed in the report. Uh, we also did mechanical testing. Uh, we did some fractography work. We did Raman spectroscopy to look at the scales on the top of the fracture surface. Finally, the most important aspect of this we did uh, most probable number, qPCR and amplicon metagenomics to assess the microbes in the well. So I'm going to step through in the next few slides uh, what caused the rupture, what caused the corrosion, what was the sequence of the failure. So let's look at the first picture. This was the first picture all of us have of what this looks like. This is, there are two, two aspects you notice. You notice there is a axial failure that runs like this, it turns, and then there is a circumferential parting here at 892 feet. But you notice another thing, it's bulged, substantially bulged here. This, you'll see this bulging here. I'm going to show you in another picture, and you'll see a massive bulging here. And this is laser scanned. Uh, we did a lot of scanning electron microscope work, uh, and, uh, and we located chevron marks. There were two direct, two orientations of chevron marks, one going in this direction, one going in the other direction. So we identified the failure origin, which was at the maximum metal loss area. We identified the size of that region is about 2.13 inches. The total area was about four inches, but the local area where the failure originated was about 2.13 inches. We also saw uh, the orientation, the direction of the crack as it started from here, Zone one was the origin, and it and it the crack ran, stopped, turned, stopped, and then a separate failure at the circumferential side. So there were various steps to the process. So whenever you do a metallurgical evaluation, one of the things you have you have to do in a root cause analysis or a failure analysis is independently come to the same conclusion. You cannot make a laboratory interpretation and not have a quantified verification of those numbers. So we sized it as a 2.3 inch long corrosion area, and it was highly striated. So the striations had a notch to it. We mimicked that in finite element. And we, what I'm showing you on this plot is what we call ductal failure damage indicator. What this tells us when this number reaches one, there is a propensity for a crack forming without, within that corrosion area. And as you can see, we have plotted it. We did multiple models. The model two with 2.13 inches, the pressure at the time of operation was around 3,000 PSI. And it shows me at 3,000 PSI, a crack would have formed the corrosion of which depth. The moment the crack is formed, the crack is unstable and it will grow unstably and an axial rupture will result. And that's what we are plotting here. We had measured fracture toughness properties. We converted that to stress intensity factor. We also had some J1C, JR data. And this is plotted against internal pressure. And what you will see is 
This is the limit of the lower shell fracture toughness. So almost at 2,000 PSI, not 3,000, this crack would have been unstable and it would have grown. So our metallurgical or fractography work of the 2.13 inches long initiation region, size of the initiation region, all of that has been validated uh, with uh, quantified fracture mechanics and uh, plasticity analysis. So we felt quite comfortable about the location, about the location of the origin, how the crack grew. Next is, of course, what caused this corrosion? This corrosion is very unusual. Uh, it is very unique. Um, people in the microbial literature talk about uh, striations and tunnels, and this is probably extensive striations and tunnels found on the seven inch. And what you will see is striations, and this is almost like fractals. Uh, you will see a striation, and when you look into it in a microscope, you'll find another striation. You'll find another striation. So there are holes, notches within notches that grow. And this area is, uh, is, and then as you take this fracture surface here and turn it around, you start seeing tunnels. And it's very easy to find these tunnels. Uh, we found numerous tunnels that, are, that is parallel to the fracture surface. And, as, and we section these tunnels way inside. And these are very small. These are micron-sized tunnels. And you, one finds organic matter. It's an anaerobic environment. There is no oxygen in there. And as, uh, uh, so this, this was the reason for uh, focusing on uh, microbial so the last two joints, joint 24 and 25, which we extracted, uh, we, uh, we had uh, our microbiologist on site, and she literally took biofilm and other samples. They were not direct biofilms, but what appeared to be maybe biofilm or maybe solid, she collected all those samples, and all of them, all of them showed a predominance of methanobacterium, which has been known to cause corrosion. It's a form of archaea, that have been known to cause corrosion. It's, it's well documented in the literature. So combining the scale modeling, combining the metallurgical work, combining the presence of tunnels and striations and the microbial analysis, uh, the microbial corrosion uh, interpretation was validated, further validated. It is again discussed in the report. Now there are two different, uh, two different uh, breaks, uh, if you remember. There is the axial rupture that was bulged as we talked about. So the axial rupture came in and it turned and it arrested at this point where my arrow is pointing. As you looked at the fracture surface, you can investigate it and it, 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 it arrested here. So based on the fracture surface, uh, our interpretation is axial rupture happened first. It stopped at this upper arrest point. And then as gas continued to escape through this region, uh, the temperature locally dropped. And then uh, another, you can see again chevron marks that point to a zone of origin on the circumferential part. So another region, a crack initiated and ran circumferentially and split into two. And you look at this fracture surface compared to the fracture surface on the axial rupture, they are very different more cleavage, more quasi-cleavage, which indicates uh, brittle failure. And we estimated the temperature. We back-calculated the temperature based on metallurgical work of minus 76 degree F to minus 38 F. Now, in parallel, thermohydraulic modeling was done, and which was independent of the metallurgy, and temperatures of minus 30 and minus 35, minus 40 were estimated. It is also documented. So again, any interpretation in a failure analysis, you have to have two different independent sets of data to validate and, and support the interpretation. So we had the thermohydraulic modeling that supported low temperatures, and uh, we also, and that low temperature will enter into the picture as we talk about the sequence. And we also had enormous uh, metallurgical evidence. So let me summarize this. Uh, this is, there were two different failure events on the seven inch. First, over a long period of time, external corrosion occurred. Uh, we lost 85% of the wall. Corrosion continued due to microbes. And then there were notches, those striations. Those notches were essential. In the absence of the notches, the FEA showed 
the local plasticity is not high enough to cause cracking at that point on October 23rd or 22nd. So those notches were very critical. There was a large patch of corrosion. You had gas escaping for a certain period of time. That period was independently established. And then that area cooled and it parted. So there were two separate events in terms of the failure. Now, uh, where did the water come? This was a big issue. We discussed this in the report in detail. Here I'm summarizing it. We drilled two boreholes on SS9, which is about uh, 200 feet, 200 feet, uh, 500 feet from, the, from SS25, pretty close. Uh, there were two distinct sources of groundwater we identified. They were shallow at 340 to 440 feet and deeper at 900 to 1,000 feet. And what you will see is there is a shoe. This is a log data that shows water source right at around the shoe here, distinct sources of water. And then we also had what we called CHDT or casing hole dynamic testers, where we sampled uh, water from behind the 11 and 3 quarter inch in SS25 and also in P35. And we got what we call nearly fresh water or what you would use the terminology groundwater. Not an aquifer, it is groundwater. So uh, we got a handle on where the water came in. The water, water entered the uh, casing, entered the annals of the seven inch casing. Before I go into the exact overall mechanism, uh, we wanted to know when did this failure happen? Did this happen on October 23rd? Did it happen prior? Did it happen a month before, a week before? We didn't know. There was some data to indicate uh, they had a pressure measurement uh, on SS25 on October 15th that showed normal pressures, A, a analyst, B analyst, and the tubing pressure. So we kind of uh, bracketed after October 15th. So but then what I'm showing you here, again, this is discussed in detail in the report. The red line is the temperature, which marks to the y-axis on the right-hand side the blue line to the left-hand side, which is the pressure, okay? So, oops, the pressure ranges from around 280 to 280, 285 to, to, to 2700. And this pressure variation, 2790, this, when it is injecting, the pressure is about 20, around 2830, 2840. When they shut in, the pressure slightly drops, it drops to 2700, 2700 range. Now, on October 29th, after around, around, around midnight, they shut the well in. And you can see the pressure drop. Pressure doesn't drop way down, it is around 2700. And if the well had failed during the shut in period, this pressure should have dropped all the way to 100, 200 PSI. It held it to 2790. So that tell, told us that it did not fail during the shut-in period. Then around 3 a.m. on uh, October 23rd, they started injecting again. And that is what this shows, around 2,700, 2,800, the pressure goes up. Now what you notice is temperature fluctuation. The temperature is defined by the ambient temperature in Aliso. And what you will see is for that circumferential rupture, I need really, really low temperature. Okay, so what, I, what we just discussed. So, the, so what we discussed was most probably the circumferential rupture happened at around 7 a.m. when we had the lowest gas temperature. And our estimate is for us to cool it, we need no more than an hour of gas flow. And so a thermohydraulic and a PROSPER model was built. And what we are showing on this side of the, on this schematic here, well was open for injection between 3 and 4 a.m. We think the axial rupture happened first. So you had injection gas flowing in at 70 million. You had reservoir gas coming in at about 90 million. You had 160 million getting through the failure, through the rupture region here, A, which is what is marked A here. And then the rest of the gas, the gas is getting to surface or in the surrounding reservoir through the holes in 11 and 3 quarter. There were more than 50 holes in 11 and 3 quarter, over 50 holes. So we were, there were about 160 million standard cubic feet of gas leaving the well bore after, sometime after 3 or 4 a.m. Now, and the rupture happened sometime after. Our estimate is the circumferential rupture happened at 7 a.m., so coming back an hour before 
we estimate the axial rupture has happened around 6, 6, 630, sometime around that. The key conclusion from this slide is both failures happen the same day. Both failures happen within an hour of each other. And we believe it happened sometime after 4, 5 a.m. based on all the data we have analyzed and the modeling we have done. So the key takeaway from here is no other, none, nothing in this failure was further exacerbated by the kill attempts or by anything that was done after the leak was dis discovered. The failures all happened on October 23rd. This is a, a, a schematic to show how the corrosion would have happened over the last, since 1950s and 70s. There is, when the well is drilled, when wells like this are drilled and there is electric log records we have located, uh, folks, uh, you have cement outside of the seven inch up to 7,000 feet. Above the cement, you have what is called a drilling mud. The terminology mud uh, is, a, is a misnomer. It could be potassium chloride, it could be any number of fluids. And this fluid was a pH of 11, 11 and a half based on the records we have looked at. So at 11, 11 and a half pH, the seven inch should never corrode. So our interpretation is, oh, and the drilling mud density most probably, not most probably was higher than the pore pressure at around the shoe. So we are hypothesizing that the drilling mud over a period of time leaked off around the shoe region. And, and then there was groundwater, which is predominantly through rain, through runoff water that permeated the vados in the surface and through falls to around 990. As you can see in some of the logs, we can find water sources. The boreholes showed us water sources. There are no aquifers in this area, so the source of water has to be the rain. So the rain gets in, displaces the drilling mud, and gets in behind the casing. And this is the this water as is, as it permeates and there's ion exchange through the clay, through the mineral as it gets to in the annulus of the two, seven inch and the eleven and three quarter, it continues to corrode the OD of the seven inch. And there is some small amounts of CO2 that we believe may have acted as a nutrient to the methanogens and continued to corrode over the long period of time. And as you can see, that corrosion became critical on October 23rd, caused the failure. This is a sequence again, the schematic is in the, in the report. So at the end of studying the SS25, we had a good handle on the failure sequence. Uh, we know the leak pathway. How the, how the leak up happened, the uh, axial rupture happened first, the circumferential cracking happened second, all of them happened on the same day. And what caused the corrosion was the microbial corrosion. There was a predominant number of data. There was data from metallurgical tunnels. There was data from scale. There was data from microbiological analysis. And groundwater is the most probable source of the corrosive media. So once we got a handle on the failure sequence, the intent was to look at the post-leak events. Now recognize when we were doing this project, uh, we did some of the laboratory work in 2018 and uh, also in 2019, early part of 2019, and some of these post-leak modeling was happening prior. So we had the thermodynamic uh, modeling, thermohydraulic modeling, so we had a good understanding of what the temperature was looking at but the metallurgical data was crucial to tying everything into the root cause analysis. So the objective of the post-leak events was as follows as we took this on. Now, if we had done this sequentially and waited for all the lab work to over and then start on the modeling, then some of these questions may have been partially answered, but not completely. The therm thermodynamic modeling and the thermohydraulic modeling was essential for us to interpret this. So the question was, when did the failure occur? What was the initial leak rate when we took on this post-leak events? What was, how did the leak rate change over time? Now, I know metallurgically we saw low temperature, but then we wanted to understand, is that really possible? If it is physically not possible, then the metallurgical observation has to be looked at differently. It could be H2S, it could be something else. So you have to be careful. So the in intent was, is there anything in the gas flow pathway and the temperature modeling that tells us 
that the temperatures will go down? What was the leak path? How did it change over time? The next question is the injection network. There is a network of gas that supplies. So now, if the rupture happened on uh, 6 a.m. in the morning, can the network not tell you that I lost gas? And we did the modeling to demonstrate, no, the network will see probably two to three PSI drop, and it will be barely visible uh, in the network total pressure. So the, they, there, was no, there was no wellhead pressure measurement. The pressure measurement was uh, downstream of the compressor. Now, how did, why did the kill attempts fail? uh you know was it did it make something worse what why why did it happen and then the question was how much gas leaked uh, during the killer, during the entire leak event so this is really a blowout timeline and i want to point out a few items here i've marked in red so the first kill attempt october 24th kill attempt number 1 the tubing was plugged this was a standard kill attempt that uh, that was undertaken in the field and this has been quite successful in the past, in the late 80s in two wells. So it was a standard application of kill attempt number one. And then once uh, everybody realized this is more, this appears to be bigger than anybody thought, then uh, well-controlled experts were on site and a well-controlled, well-controlled well, well -control experts were on site on October 26th. The second kill attempt was on November 13th, uh, which failed and and when this failed, uh, there were some notes from either Dogger or Sokal Gas or Halliburton, I don't remember at this point, which said this looked like a conventional blowout. There was debris 75 feet in the air. Then kiloton number three was immediately after 12, uh, November 15th, November 18th, and November 24th, November 25th. All of these kill attempts were very similar in uh, mode. that they were more barite used in some of these kill attempts. We discussed this in the report, but as far as overall density, it was very similar. Whereas kill attempt number seven was distinctly different. I think it was 15 ppg, and there were indications for a short period of time that it was successful, and then the well flew back again. So before we have to analyze the kill attempts, we have to build, uh, build models to understand what the well was capable of flowing. So a nodal analysis well model, which represented the entire well architecture, the reservoir, the tubulars, the deviation of the well bore, the temperature gradient, all the completion equipment was modeled. It describes the entire downhole system. This was also built using 20 years of uh, sand test or well test that SoCal Gas gave us, some very good data. There were also static pressure measurements on SS25 over its history. Weekly, there were pressure measurements. Then there was also an adjacent well, SS5, which had, uh, which had pressure data, which was used. Uh, Blade used a commercially available software called Prosper uh, to build this well bore model, which allowed us to estimate the well behavior just prior and during the leak event. That was the intent of the pro. The intent of this exercise was to understand how much gas escaped from the well to see what could have been done with the kill attempts, if any. And the pressure measurements and the and the, and the flow tests were used to match the match the Prosper model. So once the Prosper model was built, we had nine very well nine well tests that wonderfully matched our the reservoir properties that were estimated based on a lot of information provided to us from ISOCAL gas. And what you will see is each of these green points is a well test data. And this is an inflow IPR, IPR curve. It's bottom hole pressure, flowing bottom hole pressure as a function of gas rate. And this shows you, this shows you the IPR curve. This, these light blue lines are the IPR curves that match the various well tests. So the, the pressure and the amount of gas in the well at these various times are different. Consequently, the pressure is different. So the IPR curves are different. So having history matched and matched all this, what Blade did was said, okay, what was the IPR curve that would be representative of this well on October 23rd prior to the leak? And that's what this is. This is the IPR curve. So this IPR curve was, was the Blade IPR curve that, that is being used in the future as we go through flow rates, uh, flow rate estimations and kill modeling. 
what we did was then there are two two lines. This black line, this uh, this black line, is the IPR that was provided by SoCalGas in a data request by Dogger, where Dogger requested an IPR curve, which then Dogger then provided that to the national labs to conduct their own modeling. Uh, so this was this black line was what was provided to Dogger and uh, the national labs. The dashed line is the adjustment of this IPR curve to match the reservoir pro properties on October 23rd. That's, that was our adjustment, the blade adjusted it, just to see what the numbers would look like with that IPR curve. Okay. So there was a, so one of the, one of the objectives of doing all of this prosper modeling was to establish the flow rates our objective was to establish flow rates during each of the kill attempts, but of course you can establish flow rates in between too. So the flow rates are a function of the roughness of the pipe. It is a big, it's a big parameter. If you assume a badly corroded pipe, it will be a much lower flow rate. New pipe will be a much higher flow rate. And then what is called the realistic corrosion, that's the circle in the middle. So that shows you the trend that we calculated using an extensive, uh, not an extensive, uh, a deliberate PROSPER model using reservoir properties. So at the same time, uh, there, was, there were two other methodologies. I'm going to talk about one other methodology right now. Using the flow, flowing well head pressure. So as the well was shut in, well was shut in and well was flowing, you could look at the flowing well head pressure and the shut in tubing pressure because you had a tubing pressure which, which could be measured at any point on the well bore. Using that and the dimensions, you could establish what we call rate uh, tube flow upflow. It's a pretty quick calculation, and those are shown in red here. So this is a totally independent of the modeling we have done, and as you can see, it matches pretty accurately to anything we are showing. So what this shows is day of the leak, 23rd, the well was probably flowing at around 93 million or so, approximately in that region, 90 to 93 million. So it matches uh, the upflow. So there are at least two. One is a very simple method, uh, a calculator method I could use, or an Excel method. The other one is a is a more deliberate, well thought out reservoir model. So two different ways. One way you could have done it in a couple of hours, maybe an hour or half an hour. The other one will take a bit longer, but it'll be more accurate. Okay. So how do we? Again, there were independent measurements made by a company called Scientific Aviation. Uh, this was published, I think, in some magazine. It was a jet propulsion lab, I believe. They flew the line, uh, flew the area of SS-25, and these squares are what we call surface measurements. So, sorry, this was the. Oops, I'm sorry about this. I'm very sensitive here today. So the squares uh, are the are the measurements of gas that were that escaped the well on surface. The greens are our measurements. Now the difference are explainable. Uh, we believe our numbers are very ac pretty accurate here because the greens represent the amount of gas that escaped from SS25. This may not have, this may not have escaped external on surface, but it may have gone through faults or fractures downhole, which has been, you, know, you can see that from the shallow geology picture that we discussed previously. So that is why uh, the numbers we are calculating are a bit higher. So we think these numbers are pretty accurate. So our whole intent of this was to look at the kill attempt. So as you took, as you undertook each of the kill attempts, what was the flow rate? Again, I'm showing you three different flow rates. Uh, we used the best estimate, um, the estimate for the badly corroded with the lowest one and new pipe would be highest. And this was, mind you, this is flow rate through the ID of the seven inch, which was relatively corrosion free. And these red lines represent the rates at the various kill attempts. This was the kill attempt one around 93 million. Kill attempt two, I think it's around 81, 82 million. And as you can see, kill attempt one, uh, two, three, four is around 80 to 81 million. And then it doesn't drop. Then kill attempt number seven was almost uh, 56 million, if I'm not wrong, 56 or 57 million. So you can see the flow rate change over time as the field was depleting and the well was depleting. So it's representative of that. So we took that data. Uh, there is a commercially available software we used called DrillBench. There are multiple softwares. There are other softwares. Uh, mouse, yeah. 
uh, there are other softwares um, there are other softwares that that could be used we use a drill bench software um, I'm going to use a mouse here to see if that ah that's much better thank you um, so drill bench blowout software were used what I'm showing you here is a schematic that tells you how we modeled it we had a kill fluid that was pumped downhole and if you remember, those of you who have read the daily reports, the tubing was perforated. There was a plug set in below that. This was set in by the well control company, and there were perforations above. And so the fluids were dumped here. And then the fluid gas from the reservoir was coming through the ports that we showed early on, uh, through, this, uh, through the ports in the tubing that escaped through the casing went off here. So this is a schematic of how everything was modeled. Now, what we observed uh, in the kill attempts, kill attempts one through six use low density fluid. They ranged from 8.3 to 10 ppg. And most of them were pumped between five to seven, eight barrels per minute. Some of them went up a little bit, but most of these were pumped at five to eight barrels per minute. Uh, kill modeling, which we did extensive kill modeling using the rates we had from the previous slide that a successful kill was possible with 12 to 15 ppg at six to eight barrels per minute. This would have potentially killed the well. And I'm showing you an example of this. This is table 21 in the main report. What you will see is 12 ppg, eight barrel per minute, and it would have stopped the gas flow time for one circulation was 35 minutes. Uh, it would have successfully killed the well. This tells you the surface pressure, tells you the maximum pump pressure, which is 2,400 PSI, which is below the rating of the wellhead, which was rated at 5,000 PSI. So uh, we also looked at the operational requirements, and uh, we believe with this higher density mud and higher pump rate, the well could have been killed, and we discussed this in the report. And it's further uh, supported by kill attempt number seven. Uh, the modeling, there was, as far as we could look at the data we were provided, there is no indication modeling was done prior to kill attempt number six. Prior to kill attempt number seven, uh, a model was done, and I believe 15 ppg mud was pumped at high flow rates on uh, kill attempt number seven. However, the, the location conditions had deteriorated substantially. It was unsafe to continue pumping fluids uh, at that point because the crater was formed. Uh, there's, there's data in the daily report showing the wellhead was vibrating or shaking as you were pumping. So it's extremely risky at that point. So, But the fact that uh, briefly kill attempt number seven got the well under control supports the modeling interpretation that we have. So this was a summary of the post-SS25 leak events. This, this is discussed all, everything I've discussed here is discussed in depth, in detail in the report. Now, we also wanted to look at uh, other uh, casings. So when we started this investigation, our concern was when we pull SS25, we may not see things as pristine. You know, things may be deteriorated because exposure to the kill fluid or, or uh, big solids being pumped in. We didn't know, or difficulties with extraction. So we were looking at casing integrity uh, issues field-wide. We were looking for similarities and differences between SS25 and other wells. And also, we were looking for trends. Are there casing leaks that, that go up with age? They go up because of speed tight connection, lack of speed tight connection, any, any trend, any factors we were looking for. So that will give us a clue into the failure in SS25. How did we do this? It is a, it is a monumental task. Uh, it, is, it is a massive amount of undertaking, a lot of detail. Uh, drilling and completion reports were reviewed, work over and well servicing reports were reviewed, old well log data we looked at. Uh, we looked at well design, looked for similarities, differences. We looked at completion, work over, any PNA that was ever available. We were looking for confirmation of uh, casing failures, what kind of failures were described. We were looking for similarities to SS25, that was objective. So uh, they, they, there were, as, as you will see in a minute, there were indications of casing leaks over the history of the field. Uh, this was, uh, they saw anomalies in temperature log, noise logs, anomalous pressure data, smell, sound, various aspects. 
So this is the results of our analysis. Uh, again, there is a supplementary report on this topic. I would encourage folks to read it because there's a lot of detail there. There is about 124 gas storage wells we evaluated. 49 wells had casing failures. Now some wells had multiple casing failures. There were 99 failures. 63 were casing leaks. We ignored the tight spot, the parted casing, some of the others. Repairs, it included cementing, they ran inner casing, scab liners. The moment these uh, leaks were identified, they were, they were immediately fixed. <coughs> so it was not a major, most of them were minor, very, very minor to uh, very minor leaks. So, but they were identified and they were immediately fixed. However, uh, there were no failure analysis. We couldn't find any records of any failure analysis or investigation to see what was causing it, why was it happening. Uh, none of that, uh, none of that was undertaken as far as we could see the results. And what I'm showing you here is, uh, let's look at uh, the number of wells with problems. Okay, By just focusing on the red red line. There's a lot in this data one could look at, and this tells you the spud date or when was the well drilled. So in there were a big group of wells drilled in this period, uh, 1940 to 1960, where as you can see, and there were 15 wells from here, nine from here, and then there were a bunch of wells drilled in 70 to 79. There were 18 wells, so these were much newer wells, but more wells drilled in the 70 to 79 period appear to show problems than so there is no correlation with age. Then there were problems with wells in 80 to 89 also. There were five of them that showed issues. So there is really no patterns to this failures. We were looking for patterns. We looked, looked at all different angles and we discussed it in the report. We couldn't find a trend. Now, uh, this is an example of a temperature survey that was conducted on October 21, 2014. And this was required by regulations. The regulations required an annual temperature survey, noise survey, I believe. And SS25 uh, had all of those done over time. And we looked at many of them, uh, probably all of them. We couldn't find any temperature anomalies. There were no anomaly indicating that SS25 ever had a, a leak or anything. Okay, leak or anything. So there was a... 19, uh, so it's moving on to a 1988 memo, I'm jumping. There was a memo that was uh, provided internally, uh, SoCal Gas provided it to us. There was an inter-office memo that discussed the fact that a bunch of wells were old and uh, they were exhibiting some issues with casing. And so the memo discussed uh, doing casing inspection. So SS25 was on that list, uh, but for well deliverability reasons was on a low priority. Uh, there were some other wells on a high priority. They planned to log about 20 wells. Seven of them were logs within two years. Five of those seven showed external wall loss, external wall loss. Now, how accurate this depth is, is an unknown. This was uh, casing inspection technology from the 80s, but it was not uncommon even in the 80s or 90s for casing inspection. But there were quite a few indications that showed external metal loss. For we couldn't find why, but after these seven wells, uh, the the interoffice memo recommended, and there was an indication that the plan was to log all 20. But after the seven, the other 13 uh, were not inspected. Perhaps some of the 13 were then inspected in 2015 or 2012 or something in that time period, but not in the 80s or 90s. So as part of this, we also looked at general rate case submission, trying to understand what kind of issues were documented because we couldn't find any failure analysis reports. Uh, we couldn't find any data to figure out what was, what, was in the, what was happening. But there was a general rate case from 2016 where the testimony was provided in 2014. We got that, it was a lot of good information. So uh, this was a SoCal gas submission which stated that uh, previously the well work was reactive. Uh, rather than uh, proactive, and uh, there was a recognition that it needs to become more proactive, and uh, they were, uh, there was a recognition that we needed to do risk assessment. This 2014 was prior to any API, API RPs that came into existence, so this predates that. So in a sense, uh, the gas storage industry at that point, risk assessment was not being, was, was in, in our understanding, 
was not common. So this was prior. So it was pretty proactive at that time in 2014. And there was a recognition that a detailed assessment of the under, underground assets was required. And uh, we need a proactive uh, system to manage risk. So we got a lot of information now, a, a small team in Blade, consist, considering, consisting of uh, the key people who played role in all aspects of the project, got together and went through uh, a root cause analysis. This is a very structured process. We had all of this information. And if we had any gaps, we went back and filled the gaps and then again got together and went through the process. We used a, a structured evidence-based, so we can't make any statement. If we say um, a wall thickness inspection should be, con should be conducted, we have to have data that it was not conducted or it was conducted or it was conducted and corrosion was found. So it was extremely evidence-based. It was not opinion-based. Uh, the, the five or six of us who got together, our focus was to say, okay, if I make this statement, do I have data to back it up? If it didn't have data, we had to throw it out. Uh, the intent was to have no predefined assumptions about the possible causes and interpret what the root cause is. So the process is quite uh, thorough, but simple and elegant in its application. There is no preconceived categories of uh, methods, uh, processes, you know. When you do those kind of methods, you limit yourself. Uh, there could be causes that go across methods and uh, technical. So you have to be careful when you use those kind of processes. So we like this process. So one of the first steps is to define the primary effect. The primary effect was defined as uncontrolled hydrocarbon release for three and a half months to surface. This was the primary effect. So then we have to identify causes that could result in this primary effect. So we identified three different causes. We lost wellbore integrity, basically the seven inch failed. Wellbore was in direct communication to the reservoir. So there was gas from the reservoir that could flow through the casing. And the third situation was well was unsuccessfully, there was, uh, we could not be killed or controlled for 111 days. So these are the three reasons for un uncontrolled hydrocarbon uh, release for three and a half months. So then we would look at lost wellbore integrity and build the causes, why did we lose wellbore integrity? And we kept going. So this was a long process. This took us over four months of back and forth and lost wellbore integrity. And this chart is there in the, in the report, uh, so anybody can follow. And the process is continued until we have lack of data. We have no data to support any more identification of causes or it was a natural natural uh, stopping point. And you will see that many of them were natural stopping points, many of them was, we didn't have data, we didn't have information. So that is what drove our, our uh, root causes. And from there, we established the root causes. So what is root cause? Root cause is a definition that people use. They, each one of us say root causes and uh, we mean different things. So we have defined this in the report very clearly. There are direct causes, and uh, we have also seen people refer to direct causes as contributing causes. So we have lumped them into one. So the direct causes are those that if identified and mitigated would have prevented SS25 event or similar incidents. Root causes are those that if identified and mitigated would have prevented SS25 and any other well integrity incidents through procedures, best practices, management systems, standards and regulations. So that is the, so the root cause is more broader. It should prevent other integrity issues, including just not the same one. So that's the intent. So we have this broken down. It's important definition. So all, at a minimum, we all play from the same definition. So what were the direct causes? The direct causes were, there were two direct causes. One was axial ruptures because of corrosion. The rupture happened because of the corrosion. If the corrosion had not happened, the rupture, may not have, the rupture would not have happened of the seven inch casing at 892 feet. And that rupture result in uncontrolled gas flow. Now the second direct cause, this is a direct cause, it's not a root cause, was unsuccessful top kills because of insufficient fluid density and pump rates. So when you go through the process, 
and you come to the right hand side as I showed in that uh, in that chart the root causes were quite a few root causes any problem like this uh, an accident of this magnitude normally will not have one root cause. It will have multiple, and there's a lot of interplay between root causes. There was a lack of follow-up investigation historically of casing leaks. As we discussed, there were quite a few casing leaks. Many of them, if not all of them, many of them were minor in nature, but some of them required cementing the wellbore. Or some of them required uh, inner strings. But however, there was no investigation to find out why they corroded or what happened, what caused the corrosion. And the reason this is an important root cause is if you investigate and understand what caused the cause, then you can attempt to establish, it, could this happen in other wells? Could this happen in another well? Could this happen at deeper or shallow regions? So those kind of analysis you could do. Risk assessment is very important uh, and which, uh, which was recognized in the GRC 2016. You have to do a risk assessment to say what is the flow rate capable here? What is the consequence of a shallow wellbore leak? Uh, so a risk assessment would have captured and identified wells that are higher risk versus a risk is not just probability of failure, it's also consequence. Lack of dual barriers, uh, this is pretty standard. Uh, the gas was flowing through the tubing and the casing, and uh, so that, that contributed. A lack of wall thickness inspections. Okay, so five years ago, if a wall thickness, uh, if a UT or a vertical log had been run through the seven inch, you would have seen the corrosion on the seven inch, OD of the seven inch, below 685 feet. However, regulations did not require that at that point, nor was there an internal policy around it. Now, there, the top kills were unsuccessful, as we have discussed. Um, so, uh, uh, as you as you go backwards and look at the root cause, what you come up with is there is no well-specific well control plans. So that contributed, that is the root cause. Uh, the other item we talked about, uh, we, the well surveillance. The well surveillance uh, may not have prevented the failure, but would have given you an immediate indication of two things. You don't have to do any calculations. You may, you may still have to do some simple calculations, but you immediately known that you have 93 million in almost 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. And knowing it's 93 million uh, changes the way you would approach a well kill operation here. Uh, there was lack of knowledge in the locations of the groundwater. This contributed to the fact that, hey, there could be OD corrosion on the surface casing, OD corrosion on the production casing. Uh, and the, again, surface casing, you could apply CP if you see groundwater just on surface. You can't do anything about the production casing, but shallow groundwater, shallow aquifers, this is, this is a, there is a, uh, a NACE RP also on this topic, and you can protect the surface casing strings. So these are some of the root causes. Now, this is my penultimate slide, I believe. A um, lot of the, all of the current practices um, and the Dogger regulations pretty much address all, all of the critical root causes. They don't address all, literally. There are two that have, we have identified at the bottom. We don't believe are explicitly addressed and requiring a well specific kill plan is not explicitly addressed but there is a well specific well control plan that's required there currently all wells in aliso have dual barrier so this is a dramatic reduction in risk uh, there is a requirement for casing wall thickness inspection there is a requirement for a risk based well integrity system there are there is immediate i believe there is uh, well surveillance where there is uh, constant uh, pressure monitoring in tubing and annulus and uh, there are I, I believe there is a requirement in the regulations to conduct a casing corrosion study so many of the root causes and there are only two that are slightly outside conducting a casing failure analysis and ensuring casings are cemented to surface these are the only two that are not explicitly addressed by the regulations today. But all the, all the important ones, all the critical ones are all addressed. Uh, we believe it's quite safe today. So I'm going to next go through the reports and then I'll end my presentation. I'm sorry I've gone over one hour, but I would rather go through some of the details here. I apologize for it. In the previous webinar, I stuck to my timeline. I ran through some slides here. I'm going through them. Uh, main report, there's a main report we already discussed. There are four supplementary reports. There are four volumes. And 
In the first volume, we discuss approach. We, we discuss what exact data we collected. We have listed the every data request that Blade submitted as part of phase zero summary report. Phase one discusses the approach and what we documented as phase one. Phase two discusses the rig readiness and the crater cementing. Phase three goes through details of what was extracted from the well bore, what was collected, what was analyzed. Phase four discusses all the procedures used. So these supplementary reports are essential and critical complement to the main report. Now, supplementary report volume two has casing failure analysis, connection testing, microbial, casing internal, log analysis. There is a separate report just on hydrology. We talk about uh, why we landed on the groundwater, how we analyzed it, it's discussed in detail. There is a geology, SS25 geology. This was necessary to understand. All of these have to be integrated. So we have provided our understanding of the geology. There is a seven inch casing load analysis, just looking at stress analysis. What was the probability of failure? What was the, there's a lot of details there. We also discussed the annular flow system. Uh, why did we, we didn't identify that. We don't think it's a root cause. This is why this system didn't work. And what was this system? This volume three is very critical also. I would urge folks to read it. There is a section discussing the transient kill analysis. If you just want to look at kill, this discusses our model assumptions, discusses the modeling we use, software we use. The nodal analysis report talks about exactly it tells you how we calculated the well deliverability. The second one tells you why, even though we had that failure, you would not see pressure change at the compressor. Very clearly articulates that. The third report tells you the gas pathway. The gas pathway after failure, during uh, kill attempt one, kill attempt two, dis discusses this in detail. Finally, this is the final volume. Again, here we discuss, the first report discusses all the casing failures we analyzed. We also looked at log data for shallow corrosion. We analyzed that in detail, this, uh, analyzed them vis-a-vis SS25. Then we have a separate report on the 1988 candidate wells. What was done with it in 90, up to 1991, what was done since, all that is discussed there. And then we also have a gas storage well regulations review what were the well regulations? What are the regulations? We discussed that current and uh, current and past. And the last two are important because it tells you if you want to understand how the field is being operated, withdrawal injection analysis. And of course, at one point, seismic was in our radar as a part of the root cause. And we assess here that there were no seismic events during the period. And of course, there's no metallurgical proof or metallurgical data that shows that there was a seismic event. So. Uh, but we discussed, there's a say, report discussing that. So I apologize for running over, uh, but I hope we can answer questions. So I know it's been an hour and a half, so everybody on the phone would be also tired. So what I'm going to propose, guys, is, uh, what is the time now? 12.23. So we will, uh, we will get back together at uh, 12.40 Central Time. 1040 Pacific time. I hope I got that right. Okay. Yeah. We will mute the microphone until then and we will leave everything on. I'll leave the screen on as it is. If we can huddle up in 15 minutes, uh, 1240 Central, 1040 Pacific. Thank you very much. Uh, we have got a lot of questions and we've got all questions already. And I'm sure we got some during the meeting here. We will start addressing them uh, in 15 more minutes. Thank you very much.
welcome back um, we uh, we received uh, we have not received many questions we have got a lot of questions from uh, avisha patel um, i have a list of parties here i will open it up <clears throat> and um, hopefully you guys can see this on your screen um, so we're going to go through uh, we've got a uh, lo uh, about 20 questions from Avisha Patel earlier this morning. And um, I want to kind of reiterate right now, we're going to answer the questions and clarify further on this call. However, as I've discussed previously, our reports are extensive and uh, we have transcribed at different times across 100 pages. So uh, the report stands uh, if by by mistake, I, we contradict, any of us contradict what is in the report, uh, uh, the report uh, report's opinion is the right one, okay? Not what we are saying today, and we'll appropriately correct it if we find out we expect. So what I'm going to do is uh, <clears throat> there are, oops, there is extensive amount of, um, let's just shoot, that's my answer. Okay. Okay. There are extensive amount of questions here, and I'm going to, I'm going to, give me one minute, guys. I had to develop some answers here, and I can't find them. Give me one minute. Where is my... No, 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 I need mine. Okay. Give me one second, please, guys. Sorry for the technical difficulty here. That's all I need. Thank you. Okay, I'm ready to go. So all of the questions I'm going to be reading are from Avisha Patel uh, of SoCal Gas. And uh, there are about 20 questions, and uh, my colleagues and I, um, in order to appropriately distribute the load, various folks in the room are going to answer, and I'll identify them as I go along. The first question from Avisha Patel was, why did the root cause analysis take over three years to complete? That's a good question, and uh, <clears throat> There are, there are many reasons for it. Amongst them, I'm going to identify four of three or four. Uh, number one, uh, different parties had different views on what can be done, what cannot be done in this, in terms of extraction of casing, extraction of tubing. There were extensive discussions with various parties, uh, regulators, uh, which is Dogger, CPUC, SoCal Gas, Blade, and everybody had to be satisfied uh, that what we are doing, what we're getting ready to do is right, uh, safe, uh, and takes into consideration all scenarios. So we had HAZOP, HAZID, uh, risk assessment, work plans, protocols, uh, and these were reviewed by CPUC, Dogger, SoCal Gas, National Labs. So there's a lot of, lot of, lot of, uh, lot of aspects to this. And then finally, we had to get the permit from Dogger so, uh, to go in and extract the tubing. So that really was the, one of the big, large reasons. Uh, the regulators had to be satisfied that the operations were safe, and, and this, this takes time and effort, and, and it, everybody has to make sure we're doing the, carefully doing everything right. Uh, the second reason also is uh, in the, when we were getting ready to do SS25, uh, there was identified a need that we need to finish or close on a, on a patch or a very shallow, uh, some liquid leak on SS25. Or, there was no leak. It was considered uh, Dogger was very worried. So we had to do SS25A tubing extraction and cementing to a certain depth before we could get back to SS25. So uh, there, were, uh, there were a lot of work we had to do on 25A which was really not part of the root cause, but, uh, but could have been, we didn't know at that point. So we were involved in 25A extraction and that we didn't use that data at all, but we extracted it in case we needed it. Uh, the other item is uh, we had to see this casing extraction as we talked about, we can easily pull casing without, uh, we have done that 
<clears throat> in comp in a workover operation, we, we can we can pull that. It's not a big deal. But what you have to be careful in a project like this is as you're pulling them, you have to document what you one joint at a time. You have to document the scale that you collect. You have to document the corrosion, because you never know what data that we collect could either validate or invalidate a hypothesis. So at the end of the day, when we come in and say it's MIC or we say there's cooler temperature at some point, if there's any data that contradicts that, then we need to have that. The more data you have, the better. Destroying any data is dangerous. So the intent was to carefully collect the data. And then as we discussed uh, in one of the slides, when you extract the casing, you have to make sure the casing doesn't, you don't damage the fracture surface you don't damage, uh, because as you remember, with those fracture surfaces were critical to establishing the timeline. Um, and so th these were some of the reasons. And, um, and I have a detailed timeline in the report, and uh, that discusses it. Hopefully that addresses that question. <clears throat> and we can give you more specificity if required, but that's part of the report. It's in the report. Um, second question, and I'm going to be turning this over to Randy Rudolph. So Randy Rudolph will be answering the question. I'm going to be asking the question. So the question was, <clears throat> Blade stated that its list of casing failures slash leaks is different from the list that SoCalGas provided. Within brackets from uh, report page 169, Blade normalized the SoCal data to determine the actual number of wells with leaks and the actual number of leaks. And the question is, what does normalize the data mean? Randy? Okay, so, uh, as the question uh, alludes to, there was a list of leaks provided by SoCal that uh, came through the request to Blade, and Blade reviewed wells to determine casing leaks. In the uh, list that uh, SoCal Gas provided, they listed as a leak each time the leak was identified. For example, in uh, well SS25A, there was a stage collar leak that was listed in 1981 and again in 1982. So what normalized means is the uh, double counting of that leak was adjusted so that the leak was only counted once, as in the blade analysis. So when we identified a leak, it was identified one time. So you know, that being said, the set of wells that uh, blade analyzed was uh, slightly different from the data set that SoCal Gas uh, provided. And to further explain that. Uh, some leaks were identified by SoCal Gas and not by Blade, and then vice versa. Uh, another difference in the SoCal Gas list was they counted uh, casing shoe leaks, water shutoff perforations, and so on as leaks. Uh, Blade did not count those because those were not related to the root cause analysis. We were focused on uh, casing, casing integrity, and uh, so casing Q leaks were, were not in the casing and they were not relevant to the uh, root cause analysis. So I think that takes care of that one. Yep, thank you, Randy. <clears throat> the next three or four questions will be still Randy. So the next one, that was uh, all of these questions were asked by Avisha Patel from SoCal Gas, so I won't repeat that. Uh, no, no other questions have come in yet, so uh, there are about there are approximately 20 plus here. Next one, also Randy, <clears throat> were the casing failures slash leaks that you identified in the report different from each other? All right. So the term uh, casing failures is a is a broad term. And it's also it's defined in the supplementary report uh, titled Analysis of the Aliso Canyon Gas Storage Wells with Casing Failures. And the definition is, is that the condition or defect where the casing fails to, to perform 
in the manner that it was designed to. For example, uh, a, uh, a leak is obviously a failure, but failures also include uh, parted casing, uh, tight spots, and uh, there was three uh, in the other category, which were uh, <coughs> wet casing in the wellhead, earthquake, and deformation, and deformed casing. So the number of leaks was uh, 93 out of 99, so leaks were the major part of that. Also, there were four parted casings, so those those are the more serious ones. Tight spots are included because when uh, tight spots are repaired, they're normally uh, reamed or milled or swedged, so that tends to uh, damage the casing, which can cause casing leaks or lead to future casing leaks. Okay, so the next one, uh, so, for example, are stage collar leaks the same as casing leaks? Uh, yes, definitely, because a stage collar is a component of casing. It's uh, put in there for the for uh, for purposes of cementing the casing. It has moving parts. It has elastomeric seals. Unfortunately, those seals can leak with time, so casing leak and a leak in the stage collar has the same problem. It causes loss of pressure integrity for the casing. Stage collars were used uh, commonly in the 1970s in, in wells that were drilled for gas storage. Uh, many of them leaked and uh, casing patches were installed in order to mitigate the leaks. Okay. <clears throat> the next question is, and again it's Randy who will be answering this, uh, and does your list of casing leaks include leaks that occurred before Southern California Gas Company operated the field as a gas storage field? Should they all have been categorized together? That's a good question. That, as shown in the reports, we Blade identified 99 uh, casing failures. As it turns out, three of those were identified prior to 1970 and uh, the field was converted to gas storage in the early 1970s. So only three of the 99 were identified prior to the field, to the gas storage field. We looked at all the gas wells that were designated as gas storage or gas storage oil and gas by Darger. So we included the three wells just, as, uh, just for completeness. Uh, Two of those three wells identified failures in 1969, and then one was prior to that in uh, 1952 while they were drilling the well. Okay. So the next, there are two more in this section that is also still Randy. Is it more appropriate to characterize the leaks by cause, for example, corrosion, gasket, threads, etc and or by size, by size uh, the questioner means with respect to either volume of gas release or size of leak source. Example, pinhole, pitting corrosion, general corrosion, etc. That's a good question. Uh, that gets us back to what is the root cause of these leaks and unfortunately the causes of these leaks were really not characterized by SoCal gas. And the uh, lack of the follow-up on the investigation or failure analysis, we identified that as one of the root causes on uh, page 237 of the main report. The uh, reports were not very detailed, and there was not enough information in the reports to basically determine the root cause of these, these problems. And so, while the, it would be nice to define these causes in more detail, the data just wasn't there. And that was our intent when we started. So. Right. Uh, for example, in, in many of the cases, the uh, casing leaks, the reports did not show whether the leak was in the pipe body or in the connection, and that's 
that's uh, important to know. As far as uh, the, the volume of gas released, that would be very difficult to determine. Most of these leaks are, all these leaks are downhole. The gas uh, would not be possible to measure and also unless you recover uh, failed casing, you don't. You normally don't know what size of the defect was, what size of the hole, and and uh, so on. Last question, Randy, in your section here. Were there any prior casing failures slash leaks on SS25? Uh, data did not did not report any leaks in SS25 prior to the one in uh, 2000. Okay. <clears throat> The next two I will attempt to answer, and then uh, Bill and Nigel will jump in after that. Bill will jump in, and then we're going to go around on these questions. Uh, the next question is, uh, it's a good question. What assumptions were made in the determination of corrosion rate? What is the level of confidence in the rate that was calculated? Okay. So, uh, Again, I would refer everybody to this is, this is a discussion in uh, volume two, page 209, uh, section 5.6. The title of the supplementary report is SS25 Casing Failure Analysis. And I'm, what I'm going to answer is, uh, is, is described there. See, the problem is I'm, I'm assuming the questionnaire is asking me question on external corrosion. There are two, two possible corrosion locations here, external and internal. There is a separate report in one of the supplementary reports for internal where we have modeled it based on CO2 and H2S. We have numbers which show the corrosion rate is very low uh, from the ID. From the OD, the corrosion rate, uh, if you base it on the fact that it reached 85% on October 23rd, and you look at 54 or 73, and you assume a linear assumption, you say four or seven mils per year non very scientific, that is kind of an estimate of wall loss. Then depends on the mechanism. So there are multiple mechanisms at play here, depending on the type of corrosion. Uh, so we took, conducted some galvanic corrosion tests. It provides rates of 0.8 to 8 mils per year. So then we also looked at, there was a PhD thesis that discusses, which is referenced in our, uh, in our uh, in our supplementary report, which did some methanogen testing under laboratory conditions. And these environments were very different from what was encountered as S25. However, they got corrosion rates up to 1.2 mils per year. The local environment on SS25 would have accelerated the corrosion, that's our estimate. But really, we, we don't address the corrosion rate in detail because that requires a lot more study and uh, testing. In order to do that, you would have to recreate the methanogens with the proposed environment and actually estimate it. For the purposes of the RCA, we articulate the various corrosion rates that are possible from the various mechanisms, which is discussed in section 5.6 of the supplementary report. Hopefully that answers uh, your question. Um, next one uh, is question number five. Uh, I'm gonna read the question first. Images of corrosion damage showed it was not uniformly distributed, either around the circumference or along the joint length. What mechanism or mechanisms cause the relative isolation variation of corrosion damage, particularly in the areas where significant wall loss occurred? Again, very good question. This is question five, and uh, this is addressed in pages 178, to 194 in the main report, and it is also addressed in the in the in the supplementary report uh, in pages 200 to 215. Now, we, as you remember, those of you who have looked at the main report or the supplementary report, the corrosion was different types. We categorized them as type one, type two, and type three. Type one was our focus, which was the nature of striated corrosion at the location of the failure. So we spent bulk of our effort on type one, which was the microbial type, striated tunnels, all that stuff that we've discussed in the report. However, there are other two types, type two and type three. Type two is isolated pitting. Type three is uniform wall loss. Now, all of them showed varying degrees of uh, microbial behavior. 
However, we also suspect under deposit corrosion or galvanic slash crevice. We did some galvanic testing as part of this project uh, between J55 and H40. There is a small galvanic current between the two metals, and so that could have accelerated corrosion. So as the questioner described, there are various methodologies uh, that are possible, um, but we did identify different mechanisms. We have discussed all three types, type one, type two, type three. All those three types are discussed in detail in the supplementary report from 200 to about 215, 16. And then we also go into about 221 where we discuss uh, the type three corrosion, where we, artic where we hypothesize what, what possibilities exist. So yes, that's a good question. There are different types of corrosion. And, but our focus in the main report was primarily type one, which was what caused the 85% wall loss and consequent rupture. Okay. Now I'm going to question number six, which Bill Whitney will answer. But uh, let me read the question first, and then I'll turn it over to Bill. Uh, is there an industry standard for well control operation? That's question one part of the question. The second part is your conclusions on well control are based on the knowledge you gained through your investigation. Did your findings consider the information available on the well control operation while the incident was occurring? Bill. So the, uh, the answer to the first part on uh, industry standards for well control operation is yes. The American Petroleum Institute has a recommended practice. It's titled RP59. Um, and it's recommended practice for well control operations. Um, as far as we're aware, there is no industry standard for blowouts. Um, but having said that, there's uh, an extensive amount of literature and experience on blowouts going back decades. Um, so the theory, the procedures, the equipment, the analytical tools for dealing with blowouts are well established throughout the industry. Um, the data that we used in uh, analyzing the well control attempts came from data requests that we sent to SoCal Gas, and those consisted of data reports and service company reports of the activities going on at the time. So yes, the data that we used in our analysis did consider information that was available at the time in the field when this was going on. Um, so I would direct you to, in the final report, section 3.4, page 146, Section 5.2.3, uh, page 226, and also the supplementary report uh, titled SS25 Transient Well Kill Analysis. So that's where we discuss this in detail. But specifically, as far as the data goes, um, section 2.4, uh, page 10 and 11, section 2.6 page 15, uh, and then I think it's section 10, page 50. Thank you, Bill. Um, so there was uh, seven, question number seven. There were multiple questions to uh, Randy, but I counted some of them as one. So the next question is, uh, there were three, three or four questions on uh, methanogens, so I'm going to break them down. And number first question is as follows: How did you determine that the corrosion on SS25 casing was caused by MIC? Now, I want to point folks out to supplementary report on SS25, pages 178 to 194, and main report 105 to 112. We, we discussed this in detail. This is a good question. This was a very important question. So we looked at extensive metallurgical work, scale analysis, 
as part of the metallurgical work. We did FIBX, Raman spectroscopy, SCM analysis, and it's all discussed in the supplementary report and also in the main report. In, for me to summarize it, the key reasons were as follows. There were tunnels present. There was tri tunnels are very unusual. These are micron, like we discussed before, the micron level holes, and you can find them everywhere. Wherever you find striations, we have, sec we have sectioned multiple ones. And we also have a mechanism where we think these tunnels will coalesce and form a striation. And then we took the FIBX, sectioned these tunnels, and we found substantial organic matter, which was identified. Now, this would not be organic matter from hydrocarbons. We think it's deep into the tunnels. These are micron level tunnels that are going in with scale on top. So these to us indicate, um, and then on top of that, we had the microbial analysis that showed methanogens. The scale analysis did not support any other uh, MIC. So striations on corrosion, plus the organic matter, plus there were numerous sections, if you look at it, we, we, the scale that showed as organic matter and, uh, and uh, needle-like structure in the scale. There were, there were numerous uh, information that when integrated together tells us it's MIC. So I, I would not say one, in, when you interpret MIC, you can't interpret it just based on morphology. But to me, that tunnel morphology I can't imagine any other mechanism causing it. I, I'm, there is no, mic, we looked for microstructural reasons that you could form a tunnel. There was absolutely no reason for that. The microstructure was ferrite perlite. It, there's really nothing unusual there. So that is why we landed on MIC, uh, which was, uh, took us quite a bit of effort and time because it is not straightforward to do MIC quite often. And uh, of course, the casing, uh, there's one other final reason I'll tell you. There's many reasons, and it's all articulated in the report. Uh, for you to have external corrosion, there should be a substantial amount of any other mechanism, substantial amount of gas leak from the connections, and those gas should saturate the water and then cause corrosion. We could not quantify that. We could not quantify that amount of gas going into the annulus and uh, corroding it. And, and we didn't find iron carbonate, so that is another reason. So if you, when you look at all of that in totality, it is MIC. So let me read the next question, number eight. How did you determine that this methanogen caused the MIC? And number nine, I'm gonna read both questions and I'll answer them both together. The number nine question was, how did you determine that methanogen you identified was the type of methanogen that was present before the leak? Good question, both of them. Okay, um, so many samples were collected during this project. There is a separate uh, report called uh, Analysis of Microbial Organisms, Supplementary Report as part of Volume 2. I would really look at that because that will, that goes through a very detailed analysis. We took samples from scale from various locations and we conducted uh, MPN, QPCR, and Applicon Methanogenomics. QPCR, MPN we did because that's pretty standard, but it doesn't necessarily give us any value as far as this project goes. QPCR tells us the quantity of bacteria available. Amplicon metagenomics with the DNA tells you how much of that quantity is a specific type of bacteria. In this case, it was methanogen. And so that is, and so there were two joints, joint 24 and 25 that were extracted and when they were pulled from the well, our microbiologist, uh, Liz Summer, was on the rig. She actually took as many samples as possible, I forget, 40 samples or so. And then we analyzed those. Those turned out to be the most useful samples because across every location on that joint, which had striations, which had tunnels in it, we found 43, 44% of methanogens. And it is discussed in pages 115 to 118 of the main report. Now, table 13 of the main report also shows what kind of methanogen. There were methanobacterium and methanobacterium arhunsens. These are the only two that the literature has identified, and these were predominant in those samples, all the samples, not just one. If there's only one sample, you can't make that interpretation. In one joint, uh, across top to bottom of the joint, you could find it everywhere. And it was most abundant, and it's known to cause corrosion. Now, you could argue, did this happen after the event? The reason we don't, uh, we don't concur with that view 
is because we took scale, scale from the surface, scale from below. We did Raman spectroscopy within the pits. We found no sulfides, no carbonates, no pyrites, nothing that tells us it could be SRB or any of the other types. And that observation is consistent with the microbial analysis where we did not find sulfate-reducing bacteria. We should have found that in the amplicon metagenomics if that was a cause. So really, the data was very clear. The only other bacteria we found was alkali alkaline something. It's uh, listed in Table 13. And that is uh, innocuous. That does not cause corrosion. So the only corrosion causing were the two methano methanobacteriums. So hence, we landed on methanogens. Apologize for the long-winded answer, but I would urge I would urge you to look at the Table 13 of the main report, and it's also very well discussed by Liz in the analysis of microbial corrosion in the supplemental section. And there's another question, number 10, uh, where methanogen produced carbonate deposits identified in the corrosion deposits within the failed sections. Answer is no, we did not find carbonates. And in order to, there is a, the biochemical reactions that the methanogens goes through is discussed in the Appendix B of the microbiology report. What you will find is you don't, have, you don't need carbonates for methanogens to cause corrosion. Uh, there are iron oxide and the various forms of iron oxide was noticed in the scale. Uh, if we found carbonates, I would have tended towards the CO2 corrosion mechanism rather than methanogens. Uh, the fact that we had tunnels, the fact that no other bacteria was predominant, and on top of that, magnetite was higher in concentration in the bottom joints. So we land on the fact that it is, uh, it is, uh, it is methanogens. Uh, we don't think carbonate is necessary for methanogen. It's, it's discussed in the literature. And it's also discussed in the Appendix B of our report. The last question, oh, there's two more on the methanogens. OK, there's two more on methanogens. Uh, number 12, did you evaluate all potential nutrient sources? Oh, sorry, 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 I made a mistake. There is a different question. No, I'm, I'm going to go to this question. That gives me a break. <laughs> this is a question for Bill. Uh, is number 11, did you collect samples from the outer surface of externally corroded 7-inch SS25 casing samples at the time these casing sections were extracted in November November 2017, were any of these samples analyzed for the presence of microbes? Okay, yes. Um, we inspected every joint as it was extracted from the well and took um, samples from, of the material on the outside of the casing. Um, for those joints that we recovered in 2017. The, all those joints and the samples were subsequently shipped to Houston to the uh, project warehouse here. Now, we did not initially suspect microbial corrosion, because as Ravi has mentioned, that's not, that's kind of atypical. So those first samples that we took were sent for a conventional scale analysis. Now, when we subsequently became aware of uh, the potential for microbial corrosion, then we took a bunch of additional samples of the pipe around, or from the pipe around where the failure occurred. We took the, these samples at the warehouse, and those samples were exclusively analyzed for microbes or microbial corrosion. All right, in um, 2018, so that was August of 2018, we recovered some additional joints from SF25, and we took uh, a bunch of samples from those joints, and all of those samples were exclusively analyzed for microbial corrosion. So this is mentioned in the main report, uh, section 2.3.2 .2 on page 41, and also in the supplementary report titled uh, Phase 3 Summary, 
summary report. So section 3.5.1, page 20, uh, section 4.2, page 27, section 4.4, .4, page 39. And then, of course, as Robbie mentioned, what was done with those samples is discussed at length in the sub sub supplementary report analysis of microbial organisms associated with the SS25 production case. Thank you, Bill. Um, so let me go back to the question that I jumped, unfortunately. I'll go back to that. Then is question number 12 uh, from Avisha Patel. Uh, the question is, did you evaluate all potential nutrient sources for the MIC? Would carbonate in the groundwater or other assimilable organic carbon compounds in the depleted oil fields be a credible nutrient source? It's a good question. No, we did not. Uh, we did not look at all potential sources um, because uh, that would take a lot more work. Uh, at that point, once we identified MIC, we wanted to make sure there is at least one possible source of nutrient, and we identified the CO2 leaking, small leaks to be possible uh, nutrient of that. Now, in the groundwater samples that we looked for, we didn't see any carbonates, we saw sulfate. So that's why we were after SRBs to see if SRBs were there. So the groundwater had some sulfate, which was around 140 milligrams per liter, still small. Now, the question, uh, the question is valid. I, uh, are there other carbon compounds in the oil field? It's possible, it's possible, but uh, it's highly possible that there are some other carbon um, carbon containing compounds that came with the groundwater that we didn't find. We didn't find any of that in the boreholes, so it doesn't mean it's not there at the first 25. So to answer your question, we did not, we did not feel it was necessarily relevant to what we were interpreting, but yeah, it's possible there are some other sources of nutrient also in addition to CO2. And okay, number 12. Number 13, uh, is the last uh, methanogen question. So um, aside from methanogenic microbes, did you consider other possible causes of groove striated corrosion apparent on the external? What were those? Why were those rejected? Good question. Uh, we considered all forms of corrosion. We looked at under deposit corrosion, and this is discussed in various places in the report. Uh, uh, 105 to 118 uh, in the sub it's discussed in the main report and the supplementary report uh, there are as we discussed in the previous question there were three types of corrosion and all of them appear to have some microbial element the striated ones we looked at under deposit corrosion we cannot come up with that I can we cannot explain the tunnels there is no microstructural variability to explain the tunnels and uh, we also looked at SRBs, we looked at IRBs, all of those to see if there is any other, uh, any other bacteria that could cause it. Until we looked at the joint 24 and 25, we had not landed on methanogens. We, methanogen was a, was a candidate in some of the previous data we looked at. All of that is again discussed in the micro, microbial supplementary report, but um, but at the end of the day, when joint 24 and 25 came in and, and predominant uh, high quality samples we collected showed as methanogens, we concluded as methanogens. We did con include SRB, we've looked at every one of those. And we also looked at other uh, corrosion sources such as galvanic, uh, galvanic crevice. We discuss all of those in the report in the section on corrosion rate analysis and integration in the in the SS25 failure analysis report. Hopefully that answers the question. And uh, that was question number 13. So let me move on to question number 14, uh, which uh, Ishmael Sheon from Blade will answer this question. The question is as follows. Uh, please clarify the distinction, if there is one, between groundwater and naturally occurring water in shallow aquifers? Yes, uh, in our reports, we've specifically used the term groundwater 
Um, technically, groundwater and aquifer may be a coolant, but um, our preference was to use groundwater because aquifer is usually used to refer to permanent or semi-permanent body of subsurface water that's available for use for irrigation or drinking uh, or may serve as a contaminant source. And I, in California, I believe there is also regulatory, regulatorily defined aquifers such as the aquifer underneath the uh, San Fernando Valley to the south. That's the reason uh, we're using the term groundwater to refer to the subsurface water in the SS25 area. Uh, you can see conceptually uh, our concept of the hydrology in the Elisa Canyon field hydrology report, uh, specifically in page 30 of that report, and you can find that report in volume two of the supplementary report package. Uh, so next question. This is an also Ishmael question. Uh, aside from the borehole sampling at SS9 well site, how did you assess or investigate groundwater conditions at SS25? Uh, yes, our data sources for hydrology are listed in the uh, Elisa Canyon Field Hydrology Report. As I mentioned, you can find that report in, the, in Volume 2 of the Supplementary Report Package. Uh, specifically section three, page seven, and the the sources are ba are um, the data sources are the groundwater monitoring wells, including the uh, groundwater elevation measurements, as well as the samples you obtained from the wells. In um, about the two wells that are drilled 600 feet to the south of the SS25, there were also seed samples that were collected by a, another, uh, I believe, Geosyntec, another uh, contractor. Uh, there were geophysical well logs that were run in both SS25 and one of the test holes, uh, specifically nuclear magnetic, magnetic resonance, NMR, and ELAN, which is electric log analysis, um, as well as CHDT or case hole uh, uh, dynamic, dynamic tester samples that were obtained from those wells. We've supplemented that data with the meteorological data, historical from the Elisa Canyon area for the past 20, uh, 20 years, as well as background research uh, on the hydrology of the area. And specifically, there was actually a comprehensive study that was uh, put together in the 60s as a part of a legal case called the Report of the Referee that actually has a lot of uh, useful information. Thank you, Ishmael. Uh, the next question, question number 16. Hang on. Uh, number 16, how did Blade determine the amount of groundwater that, that would have been present in the annulus between the production casing and the surface casing prior to the leak? How would it have fluctuated over time? This is a good question. Uh, we, this is an important question because we also had this uh, the concern. This, uh, so we looked at the distribution of corrosion on the OD of the 7-inch, and it is shown on, pay, on page 103, figure 88 of the main report. What you will notice is when you go from the top of the wellbore to about 680 feet approximately, there is no corrosion or very little corrosion. Then from 685 all the way to 1024 feet, slightly up below the shoe, you will find all sorts of corrosion, type one, type two, type three. Varying depth, striated, pinhole, grooves, isolated, you'll find every type of corrosion, which you have characterized. Okay? And so that tells us, that kind of told us indirectly that the liquid level in, this, in the annulus, the corrosive liquid level was 685 and below, or 600 and below approximately. It was not about that. So that was one indication that told us the water level prior to the incident, prior to the leak. Now, there was another analysis done. Uh, Nigel and Ishmael did it in extensively. They looked at temperature deflections. They looked at the temperature data from SS25. In detail, they zoomed in on the first 1,000 feet for the last 30 years, I believe. It is on figure 86, page 101. What you will see is at around, there is a shallow, there is a, there's a shallow deflection in temperature 
which we believe is related to surface cooling, which is typical of Aliso Canyon wells. That is not that is not relevant to this. However, when you go down to around 700 feet, you will see a consistent blip in every one of those temperatures, which to us indicates a water level. It's approximately 700 feet. It changes a little bit. So that is how we established the liquid level in the annulus. So we had two different ways, and we felt quite comfortable that that was the water level. So we have a few more questions, important ones. Uh, number 17, and Greg Asher, uh, who is uh, going to answer these questions, the next two, next three, actually. And let me read the first question, question number 17. Uh, we have numbered uh, the questions here for ease. Uh, the question says, the um, blade says the IPR within brackets reservoir strength was underestimated by SoCal gas in the RCA. Does this analysis apply to the first few days of the event or after a point in time where depletion had occurred? Did Blade factor in any flow path limitations in modeling the leak? Greg? There, we had, speak to the mic. Oh, there. Yeah. We, uh, there are two IPR reservoir strengths that we discovered in the data provided by SoCal Gas. The first was an IPR curve that SoCal Gas sent to Dogger through email via request of Dogger, which is the same as Ravi discussed earlier in his presentation. The SS25 well nodal analysis supplementary report discusses that in detail which is figure nine on page 27, compares as given as Ravi had shown before. We handled adjustments in time through uh, reservoir pressure changes in time. All other properties of the IPR model were constant. You can also find this in the main report in figure 113 on page 131. Um, the point that was important about that model and when we're looking at it, is that at all points in time, from first leak to the when the well was killed, that IPR was not representative of the SS25 well in any way at all, and it would underpredict. The second we found was a deliverability curve for a mixed VLP IPR that was found in a SoCal gas worksheet provided by SoCal. The SoCal gas had used fast production well test, which is identical to the same well test that Blade used in our, our model building. The method that SoCal gas used required the, the wellhead pressure before the choke, and in the analysis in that file, the, um, they used the wellhead pressure after the choke. So we actually took their Excel, and this was all data available at the time of the leak, so we took the Excel spreadsheet and changed it to using the column before the choke as it should be. And that methodology of SoCal gas would get a 91 million a day uh, gas rate. Uh, we used an Excel trend line through the data. We didn't do any interpretation or trying to fudge or throw out any data. We did feel later that a lot of those well tests were bad and caused scatter and everything else. But in that one, if that chart had been done with the pre-choke data, yes, it could have been used in time from the initial um, from the initial leak till the well was shut off. Again, with using the reservoir pressure for that, we for following the reservoir pressure, we just used the neighboring uh, SS5 monitoring well, which was available at the time. It was being having its pressure measured daily. And as far as flow path limitations go, we spent a lot of time trying to address the flow path. Um, the main calculation of rates could be determined from the tubing head pressure and casing head pressure. And those rates never would change, but then the question was, was the amount of rate that we have out, could it go through the surface casing and the amount of holes, and where does it go from there? The complete details of all of that flow path work, again, are in the SS25 well nodal analysis file. And it's also in the, um, it's in section six, estimation of leak rates post-injection shutoff. There's an entire section for that. 
The flow path limitations were also discussed in detail in the report in section 3.3 and an entire supplementary analysis report of post failure because we were really concerned with where did the gas go after it left the well? Did the gas, could the ground handle it? It's like we're estimating rates that were higher than the flow flyover rates. Why were our rates higher? And it comes out that by considering the whole flow path of how it went into the ground, could it disappear? Um, the, the flow path limitation even changed like after the first kill when uh, the top part would have frozen at that time when it was going through the holes in the surface casing. All of the data comes back to be at that time. It looks like it then would have gone down, down, passed through the shoe, the casing shoe, and out into the formation. Would have been injected into the ground down there, which was fractured. That would not have been going to the surface. It might have been appeared at that time that the leak was dissipating when it really wasn't. If you went from the wellhead pressures, it was still leaking just as bad but there was a different path of, uh, for the flow. So flow path limitations was a very important uh, part of our work. Thank you, Greg. And, and for the first part, the Excel part, it is also addressed in the supplementary report. Uh, the, the Excel sheet is in the final report. Final report. Final yeah. report. It's... Uh, <coughs> uh, give the pay section number or page number. Uh, may, uh, figure 116, page 134 in the final report. Thank you. The, the correction of the Excel report. Thank you. So it's part of the main report. So next question also for Greg. Greg has two more now. Uh, what assumptions did Blade use for its dynamic modeling? Would these have been known at the time of the incident? Uh, I, there's one more question. Sure. I'll with the next one. So okay, one. I'll do the both. Okay, let me read it again. There are two questions. I'm going to combine three, actually. I'm going to combine all of them. What assumptions did Blade use for its dynamic modeling? Would these have been known at the time of the incident? How long did it take Blade to perform the dynamic modeling? And the reason I want to answer those together is, is it's part of our approach that we took to the modeling. Uh, for the, I'll take dynamic modeling to be our dynamic rate modeling and our dynamic kill modeling because both of those aspects were linked together. What we did was we did a first pass early on in the data after, early on during the RCA after the data had just been collected. We did the, there were reviews, we did the, sorry, at the first pass, both dynamic modelings were conducted. There were reviews over time of the rate modeling to help guide the work, for example, later over time to determine the total areas and the case hold benefits. We would go back and look to help guide what they would do or what data we were collected. We did a first pass and we got high rates. We got that the well wouldn't have been killed, but we weren't gonna state that as a final claim. We wanted to make certain enough data was collected that we could really validate and believe in those rates and believe in the kill statements. So we did a first analysis and then had a lot more data collected. The first pass of the rate modeling, we only did at the key points right before the kill treatment we did for the rates and the pressures, and those were given to the kill treatment. We didn't do it over the whole history or try to estimate a whole rate history. Just at the time they were trying to do the kill so we could see what the rates were at that time. The only data we used in those was the data that was available at the time of the incident. Later, and that's when we got that the kill treatments wouldn't have worked and the rates wouldn't have been high. And then later in time, we got more to validate. For the initial rate estimate, we got a rate estimate of 100 million a day. Getting that first estimate was a quick estimate using PROSPER. It took an, an hour with available data. We made simplifications like the flow was methane only, it's a vertical hole, it's new pipe, and a linear geothermal gradient. A lot of the questions, you know, what would you do if you had a quick go? But we spent more time, well, we know it's not new pipe. Where is the, what would be the roughness? Because the rougher, the surface roughness of the pipe over time as it changes their scale would slow down the leak rate and lower the leak rate. So a lot of data was collected later to refine the number, but right up front, it was 100 million from the start. The key rate points estimated in the first pass were done 
uh, with Prosper completely in a week. The dynamic kill modeling on our first pass took two weeks. Uh, due to the seriousness of the findings, we took a lot more time than just that. But that one week and two weeks would have been what our answer would have been if we were first doing it on the site and what you have to go for. And is what one person, someone I work with, told me if I tell him 100 million, he's going to go design for 120 because he's not going to trust me that it's that accurate. So, but we did in time do the series, spend a lot more time. Uh, I don't have the, the exact account. I know that the person who did the dynamic kill modeling and myself, we worked on this project to start. We did the first pass and then we both went off onto other projects and were not involved in this and didn't come back till the end to finalize it together. Thank you, Greg. <clears throat> Hopefully that answered the question. The last question on this list is, uh, did you evaluate, uh, Nigel Alvarez will be answering this question, did you evaluate the accuracy, reliability of wireline casing inspection tools before the year 2000? No, we did not formally evaluate the accuracy and reliability of the uh, year 2000 and over. You have a microphone? Sure, I'll bring it closer. Yeah, so the answer is no, not formally. Um, but we did look at some specific wells, and we did present a comparison of uh, some old logs versus some new logs. Of a title, review of 1988 candidate wells for casing inspection. Uh, table one on page 10 shows the wells from that 1988 memo. Uh, which ones were logged, which ones were not logged. Uh, for the ones that were logged in 1988 or so, there's a summary of findings uh, where the corrosion was found. Uh, and then in for those logs, the subsequent log, uh, a more recent log, say in the 2000s, a summary of that finding was, was listed. So we compare the old logs versus the new logs in that table. Additionally, uh, figure 15 and figure 16 of another supplementary report, Aliso Canyon Shallow Corrosion Analysis. Uh, th these figures are page 26 to 28 of that report. Uh, they sh it shows a well, FRU4 or F4. Uh, there's a comparison of a 1988 Vertilog and a 2016 ultrasonic inspection tool or imaging tool. Uh, as well as figure 21 of the same report shows SS8, a different well, from a historic log versus a new log. Uh, additionally, there's uh, FF34A. It's a well that blew out in September of 1990. Uh, a Schlumberger electromagnetic thickness log was run in 1991, and it identified the location of the, uh, the rupture or the casing hole. Um, so we don't have a formal uh, study evaluating these uh, historic logging tools, but we do find uh, credible results and that they compare well with modern logs. In some cases, there are differences, uh, and they could be related to the type of tools used. For example, most of the historic casing inspection logs were MFL tools or magnetic flux leakage tools, and they don't compare as well with the modern ultrasonic tools, but they do compare well with the modern MFL tools. So uh, technology, like technology, compares well, MFL to MFL. That's it. Thank you, Nigel. <clears throat> so we've got a couple more questions. Uh, what I'm, if it's okay with you guys, we will take a five minute break and we'll come back just five minutes. It is uh, 1, 140 right now, uh, which is 1140 Pacific time, 1145, 145. We'll be back. Thank you. Any other questions, please send it to us right away.
Hello, uh, welcome back. Uh, there are two other questions. The questions are from uh, Mina Botros from CPUC, uh, the CPUC Public Advocates Office. I will read the question and I will answer. Uh, first question is as follows. What are the actions that SoCal Gas took to minimize the gas leak volume post-leak event other than the kill attempts. <clears throat> the biggest action that SoCal Gas took was depressurizing the entire field. So depressurizing the field, uh, getting gas out through sales lines, uh, reducing the inventory of gas that was there in the field. And in Greg's analysis or the well deliverability analysis, that is reflected in the SS5 pressure measurements and consequently in his rate calculations. The rates would have been much higher if that depressurization had not been done. So yeah, that was extensively done. I forget the exact date. It's there somewhere in the report. It's days after the leak event happened. So that was done. That is, that is the action that was taken. Uh, the second question, let me read this one. Do you think there could have, there could have been other actions made the gas leaked in 111 days less than what was leaked. Uh, yeah, we went through a root cause analysis, like I said, a structured uh, RCA process. Uh, other than the kill attempts and the uh, depressurization that we just discussed, there's really nothing else you can do in a case like this. And of course, eventually, as the well was killed, they did a they did a well intersection. Uh, yeah, nine. How much? Twenty. Uh, 6th November? Yeah. 6th November. 16th. 16th. Yeah. 13th. 13th. There is some massive amount of depressurization that is reflected in the data. But the, the field was shut in right away, but then the depressurization started on those dates. That's reflected in all the data that we have and all the analysis that was done. Um, <clears throat> any other qu uh, There are no other questions. I'm looking at my team here in the, at the email. Uh, there are no other questions. Uh, I appreciate, I, I didn't realize I would actually take two hours and 45 minutes. I apologize. Uh, Jack Mulligan was hoping that I would be done in one hour. Uh, I apologize for that. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending. Uh, as uh, Christina said, this is recorded, and uh, thank you very much. Bye.